Welcome everybody to uh, tonight's Bekai program meeting. I'm going to make uh, an announcement, and we're going to have an announcement following that, and then we're going to we're going to get started. Um, there's going to be a North Bay BOF event on Tuesday, January 27th, at, in San Rafael. And uh, Michael Ann Rogandino from Rocket Communications will be speaking case study rapid fire UI design. Uh, the, our January program isn't up yet on the site, but uh, keep an eye on it. Uh, we're going to be recording tonight's presentation. And uh, usually we have two microphones with uh, two volunteers roving. But tonight we're going to do something a little different. We have one microphone here, so it asks that people queue up to ask a question. And uh, we questions are great, and we, we like to have them on the recording. Uh, in a, not, uh, instead of just having the response. And you'll notice that we have two volunteers posted by the door in the back. We have Fred and Stacy. Um, if you have any AV-related questions or comments about the sound, about the presentation, uh, please go to them, and they will speak to Deanna and the booth. Uh, the AV booth is for park personnel only. Wendy? If you're looking for a way to get involved with Bay Kai, there's a great opportunity available. We're looking for another dinner coordinator to volunteer. It really is minimal work. You meet the speakers. It's a great chance to interact with other Bay Kai members. If you have interest in this, please give me a call at 650-567-9363, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Rashmi? Hi. Welcome to the last program of Bay Kai for the year. So we are back with another discussion of usability and ROI. And this time, we are approaching the topic from a slightly broader perspective, talking about the business of user experience. Um, as, we, as we all know, for a little while, the usability community has been kind of wrangling with this issue as to where we fit in within the business. And this, uh, within the businesses. And this panel is an effort to bring to you the experiences and perspectives of um, some members of the community who've been kind of trying to deal with the problem in their own work. Um, so with that introduction, let me introduce you to the panelists. We have Scott Hirsch. Scott is an independent consultant uh, working with Adaptive Path. He specializes in project finance and development processes. He is, has an MBA from UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. And currently, he's working on a report on the return of investment of user experience design a collaborative study sponsored by Adaptive Path and Haas School of Business. Um, next, we have Klaus Kaskart, who is a user experience research manager at Yahoo. He holds a PhD in human-computer interaction and has published books and papers uh, in this topic. Uh, Klaus, as his presentation will so show, has been thinking about this topic and will tell us a little bit about, will be offering examples from his um, and others' work at Yahoo. And then we have Jeff Herman, who is a manager at eBay, where he focuses on uh, overall design guidelines, long-term strategies. Um, Jeff got his MS from the MIT Media Lab, uh, where he designed and developed an adaptive, personalized audio news, gu news guide. He, hold nine, he holds nine patents, which include design work on software and consumer electronics. And Jeff is going to be talking with us, uh, uh, telling us a little bit about eBay's process for um, proposing justifying user experience projects. Uh, so we're going to go kind of in the order that they're sitting, starting with Scott, and then going on to Klaus, and then Jeff. And that was the order was deliberately chosen. So Scott is going to talk about the topic on a very broad level. And uh, Klaus is still talking about the topic on a broad level, but kind of narrowing with some examples from Yahoo. And Jeff is really approaching the topic in terms of a specific process, a tried and tested process at work. Um, just in terms of the structure for the panel, we'll have 20 minutes for each of the panelists where they'll present their ideas. And if you need any clarifications, it's fine to ask it at that point, but we ask you to hold off the questions till the end. So after all three panelists, then we'll have an open question and answer session. Um, as Marta said, could, if you could come up here to ask the questions, that'd be great. I'm a little concerned that there's no mic on that side. Uh, but it is nice to have the questions on the video. That's the reason for doing this. If you could keep your questions short and to the point that everybody has, who wants to has a chance to ask the questions. 
Also, a lot of you emailed me after the talk um, asking for the slides, and uh, Bekai has a plan of putting the slides online. But in the e meantime, uh, email me if you want the slides or the meeting notes, and I'll email it to you. Uh, the slides that we have the permission to share with you. Sometimes we don't get it from the speakers. So with that, it's uh, over to Scott. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Scott Hirsch. Uh, I want to start just by saying that I am not a designer, <laughs> as the quality of my PowerPoint points will very clearly show. Um, some people joke at a business school that an MBA is a degree in PowerPoint, and if that were the case, I would have flunked out. So I'm just I'm not very good at that. Um, I also um, don't know that much about computer science. I was going to minor in computer science as an undergraduate, and I took. Um, I got all the way through digital logic design, which was notoriously the hardest class um, at my undergrad, which was UVA. And then I took um, uh, assembly, uh, computer architecture with assembly language. And after that, I was like, forget it. I'm, this is not cut out for me. So I tend to be much better focused towards macro level conceptual stuff. And so that's what I'm talking about tonight with valuing user experience investments is sort of at the high level um, what you need to consider when you're looking at um, in terms of developing a process for valuing user experience design. OK, so um, I got started in this work by um, when I was in business school. I, I worked on a project with one of my professors. It was actually a, a long-term study to try to quantify design investments in product development processes. And so we talked to a lot of, we did a literature research, and we talked to a lot of people at firms like IDEO about how they quantify returns on investment in design. And that's how I got started looking at this question. And then I started working with Adaptive Path on actually the same research question, but geared toward, more towards online user experience. And we found that actually the issues are very, very similar. Um, there's a lot of analogies between the two business problems. Um, I tend to talk a little bit fast. So if I talk too fast, please let me know. And my southern accent comes out when I'm nervous. So I don't usually sound like this. Um, first, I wanted to say that. Um, I don't know if anybody read this article. It got a lot of press. Um, I know not everybody can access the HBR, but the article itself got a lot of press. It's called IT Doesn't Matter by Nicholas Carr. It came out back in May. It got written up in Business Week and The Economist and lots of local newspapers. Basically, what the premise of the article was that um, IT doesn't matter and that companies shouldn't invest in IT anymore. And that um, IT has become a commodity product, that a second mover advantage is what's going to get you ahead, not by investing in the, the latest, coolest, fanciest IT, but waiting and seeing what emerges out of the melee of the latest IT improvements, and just being a second mover, and that being on the bleeding edge will bleed you dry. Now, this article got a lot of controversy, obviously. Um, I think wrong, wrong, controversy in a wrong way in some respects in that he was talking mainly about hardcore top dollar investments in hardware, in very complex software packages. He wasn't really talking a lot about um, things like usability or user experience. But one of the underlying premises of the article was that um, new technology is not where the competitive advantage is. Rather, you should do more with the IT that you have. And I started thinking about that in terms of user experience. And I think that user experience is a wonderful way to get more out of the IT that you have. And it is a sustainable competitive, ad competitive advantage, as um, the folks at Yahoo and eBay both know very well. Um, and Amazon, for that matter. Um, doing, so how do you do more with user experience? Well, then I started thinking about, well, what is user experience? And as the best definition I could come up with was that it's a design approach centered on user needs and behavior. And it has a whole different set of tools in, in its toolbox that you can use to affect a good user experience. You've got information architecture, usability, navigation, interaction design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, then I was going back to Marketing 101 when I was in business school, and we talked about pretty much exactly the same thing when we were talking about customer experience, which is a design approach that addresses user needs and, you, and behavior. And your tools there are brand, advertising, PR, corporate identity, architecture, et cetera. And customer experience is a very holistic thing, the same way that I think that user experience is more holistic than people give it credit for. Um, companies that are notoriously good at customer experience are places where you know that company just intuitively. You just feel that company. And I think a really good example is the Gap. Um, when you walk into a Gap store, no matter where it is, you feel the Gap. You know what the Gap feels like. You know what its fixtures look, look like. You know what its music sound like, sounds like. You know what its clothes look like. Um, and that was actually very, a very calculated investment on their part that they've been working on for years and years and years. And I actually have some 
classmates who, who work at the Gap and brand, and it's one of the things that they look at, and they actually do financial quantification on, on those investments in corporate identity. So I think it's a good analogy to the user experience problem, because user experience is so much more than just usability, which is where I think a lot of people tend to get bogged down, is just thinking about navigation and usability. OK, so then um, I was looking at breaking, OK, in business school, you learn to always break things down into the things that you can control and the things that you can't control. The things that you can control are the things that you try to invest in, and the things that you can't control are the things that you try to mitigate. And it seems to me that user needs are the uncontrollable things in this equation. So what the tools do is based on user needs, is based on user research, is based on our intuition of the customer, and it's based on our high-level vision for our company. Now, on the flip side of that, user behavior is the things that we can control. And that's where um, you examine how well the tool does what it's supposed to do. And you can, you can analyze that very carefully by choosing the proper metrics. And um, you know, it's my belief that you can actually design metrics that bridge the gap between web metrics, things like traffic and eyeballs and such, and such as that, into actual quantified um, dollar amounts. And not just in terms of cutting costs, but also in terms of building brand equity and building revenue and generating sales and generating leads, which I think Jeff is going to talk about in more detail later on. Um, some business analogies that came to mind immediately for me when, when Rashmi asked me to think about the business of user experience was, were some, some that didn't work, some from the 90s, from the, from the dot-com boom days. And one of them was that the analogy of publishing, that a website is really just a fancy way of publishing. And I don't think that one worked because people don't still today understand what the true value of content is. Um, you know, companies that have ostensibly incredibly valuable content, take the New York Times, for example, give theirs away for free. All you have to give them is your zip code. And you know, that has value for them, but it's not a dollar amount. Um, software is a yes and no. Um, I think in a lot of ways you can think of a website as software um, in that it's really helpful to look at usability issues in the way that the software industry looks at usability uh, of its products. Um, but no, I think the long cycle and cost of ownership factors don't make it a very interesting analogy. Um, and I also forgot to give the caveat. I'm going to be talking about user experience primarily on the web. I'm not talking about software. So um, I just need to throw that caveat in there. Um, and then the whole retail analogy. And then there's the question. I remember reading articles in 1998 about how the, the web was going to run all the big retailers out of business, because why on earth would people pay you know, top dollar to go into a store when they could get it for much cheaper on the web? Well, clearly, retail and brand had value that people didn't recognize. And you know, a lot of people were saying that companies like Amazon weren't going to work because Amazon couldn't discount as deeply as some of the other smaller fly-by-night websites. And shop bots would lead you to those smaller fly-by-night ones. Well, it turns out that people didn't trust those smaller fly-by-night ones as much. And so they tended to go to places like Amazon instead. So there is value on the web in retail and in brand. And I think that's one thing that user experience has a really big impact on. Um, I think some analogies that are worth examining are the catalog industry. Um, in particular, the way that they analyze use of space and use of content. They have very intense metrics for, examin for examining the value of those two things in their catalogs. Um, and I think you know, it's really interesting. I mean, Sears has been around since 1906. And then another company that people thought that was going to be a fly-by-night and not go anywhere was Design Within Reach, which launched in 1999 as an online-only furniture store with a catalog model. And actually, it's one of the fastest growing companies in the retail space today and is probably going to go public next year. But you didn't hear that from me. Um, software, uh, another analogy that's worth examining is the software subscriber model, um, which is, I, I think, a better way to look at software in terms of user experience. And that is that when you're a subscriber to a software package, you're paying for it as long as the software suits your needs. And when it stops suiting your needs, you don't subscribe to it anymore. Um, which I think is a way that we need to look at user experience as a very continuing relationship and something that we continually tweak and look at and examine metrics. Um, another one would be manufacturing. Um, issues of total quality management, balanced scorecard, and Six Sigma. And um, I put that little asterisk there because um, I've been seeing a lot of writing about Six Sigma lately on um, Use It. And um, actually, I wrote about that <laughs> back in July on Boxes and Arrows. And I'm not saying that Jacob copied me, but who knows. <laughs> um, 
Investing in user experience. There's three ways that this is looked at primarily nowadays. I think some are more interesting than others. First is the traditional software cost-benefit analysis. Um, I think the best example of this is a pretty seminal book called Ch Cost Justifying Usability that I'm sure a lot of people in this room have read. Um, the reason that's not as interesting for user experience, in my opinion, is that cost-justifying usability is views investments in usability as costs. It does not view them as investment opportunities, as opportunities to build brand, as opportunities to develop stronger relationships with customers. Rather, it just views them as a cost that needs to be made as small as possible. Um, then the other way to look at it is through a, a, a holistic product development process, which is what I was doing with my professor back at Berkeley with firms like IDEO. And um, this one is much more interdisciplinary. In a classic product development process, you don't just have designers around the table. You have designers around the table. You have marketers around the table. You have engineers around the table. You have finance people around the table. You have business owners around the table. And that interdisciplinary interaction is what gives you this wonderful user experience because you have all these different points of view represented um, and customers as well. And product development processes are very product focused. The last one is return on investment, which has been getting a lot of buzz lately um, in the user experience community. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail here. Um, I think the first thing that you that is most often cited as a possible outcome of understanding ROI in terms of user experience is this first italicized phrase, investing X dollars in UX will yield a return of, of Y dollars. And I I think that's a red herring. I really don't think that a generalization like that means anything to anybody um, because ROI is not empirical and it's not the way that finance people use ROI. Finan finance people use it as a project valuation means. It's comparative. It's not something that they use to say, oh, we need our, our budget to be multiplied by a factor of five because we want our return to multiply by a factor of five. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so what's more interesting is the thing on the right, which is the micro approach. Um, project A returns X dollars next quarter. Project B returns X dollars next year. Now, in, in that example, I used time as the variable that changed. We're assuming the return there stayed the same, and so did the investment. It could also be that project A and B return money next quarter. It's just that project A returns more. Um, either way, it's clear that one of the projects from a dollar standpoint is the more valuable project to the company. Um, so ROI comparisons help you prioritize projects and separate long-term problems from quick wins, which is the time analogy that I just gave. So then there's the question of, well, how do I use ROI to get more resources for my user experience department? Um, if I can't like go to my CEO or my CFO and present them with some formula that says if they give me more money, I'll return more for them. And that is what I'll talk about next, which is about budgets and headcount. And um, based on my experience, having worked with some clients and doing the research study with Adaptive Path, um, we found that one of the problems is that user experience tends to live in another department. It, it, it almost never is its own department. Um, and if it doesn't live in another department where it's sort of the minion of that other department and very closely tied to its budget constraints, it's often separated throughout the company in little teeny tiny fiefdoms in various parts of the company. And so, it's often hard to like make a case for a user experience investment in that way because you don't have as much pull um, higher up where the resources are allocated. Um, and for these reasons, total budget and headcount tend to be fixed in the short term. So the the I on the user on the ROI, the investment, tends to be fixed in the short term. And so what you're doing is you have a, a portfolio of possible projects that you can invest in and a very limited amount of I, a limited amount of investment dollars to invest in them. And that is usually constrained by the number of people in your department. Although sometimes you can make a case to outsource a particular project if it has a, a large enough need. Um, and so, you know, it's really easy to allocate quick wins within budget constraints like that. You know, because you can, it's very easy to say, oh, well, we should invest in all these quick win projects right now because we can do them all and we have the headcount to do them and we won't have to go up to the CEO and make a huge argument about why we need more headcount or why we need to go to a consulting firm. Um, so how do you advocate beyond the quick win? Um, I think doing ROI calculations, and I think Jeff is going to talk a lot more specifically about this, can build a business case that the finance people in the company will understand. Um, and so it's, you can basically put the business problem in terms that people that are used to valuing investments 
can put side by side with other types of investments and say, hey, this is just as valuable as an advertising investment, or this is just as valuable as a rebranding effort. Um, another thing that we've seen in, or that I've seen in companies that I've worked with is that the web can often be a place to test new market strategies in a cost-effective way before they're rolled out to the whole company. It's sort of like a virtual testing ground for marketing and communications in some situations. So this is another way to argue for more investments in user experience. Um, but I think it's important to note dollars should not be the only criteria. I mean, ROI is a very finance-heavy tool, but there should be lots of criteria that you take into consideration. Um, and how do you do that? You build a good business case to prioritize your projects. I think the four most important things that I've seen in good business cases are designated accountability so that there's a business owner specified in the business case. And that shouldn't, well, I don't want to say shouldn't because I don't want to be proscriptive, but it often best, it's often best if it's not somebody who lives within the user experience department, that it's not a designer. The business owner should be somebody outside who controls that piece of the customer relationship. Um, and that way that those people, once the, once the design team, thank you, once the design team comes in and says, you know, this is how we can help you fix this problem, that, that problem will have a life after that project ends. And that's with the business owner. Um, another piece of a strong business case is for defined selection criteria. And I divided it into three categories, returns. For instance, revenue, there should be a comma there, cost savings and competitive position. Um, investment costs, which are things like technical feasibility, time to market, and opportunity cost. And when I say opportunity cost, I mean often investing in one project means that you're foregoing another one. And so you need to consider the value of the foregone project. And then the other, which is politics, strategic importance, and real options. I mean, these tend to be real biggies. They can be real big fudge factors in the, in the selection criteria. So you should try your best to have some type of weighting that you follow as closely as possible. So um, that a highly politicized project can get through if it really, really has to, but that the highly politic but that politicizing a project will not become a lever to making a project go through if you're a very charismatic business owner. I don't know if that made any sense. Um, determine performance metrics. This is key, critical. Um, I did a project with Cathay Pacific Airlines. They call them key performance indicators, and they go into the business case from day one. They also analyze them all through the project, develop a pre-case scenario and a post-case scenario and continue examining the metrics on into the future so that they can inform projects that affect that piece of user experience ad infinitum until that piece of user experience isn't important anymore. Um, and then finally, con establishing continuing ownership and ongoing accountability, which is what I was just saying and I didn't realize, but that somebody owns this piece of accountability for user experience continually. Um, so takeaways. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways is to think about projects as interventions that can change customer behavior. And like, it's really hard for me to get my head around this sometimes, but really that's what it all boils down to is changing behavior. Um, and one of the things that got me really thinking about this in a way was um, BJ Fogg's book, Persuasive Technology, which came out over the summer, I believe. Um, it's not really written from a user experience perspective, and it's not really written from a business, uh, a business perspective either, but I think it has a lot of valuable understanding of both fields. Um, attach business value, and by that I mean dollars, to changes in behavior. So try writing a business case for whatever your proposed project is. Um, and beyond the quick win, the, case, the business case becomes more and more and more important in doing a good business case. Um, develop criteria for evaluating projects. And then finally, um, assigning ongoing accountability for performance metrics. Okay, and then just finally, I, really quickly, I just wanted to talk about the, the study I'm doing with Adaptive Path, which um, is going to evaluate, evaluate um, between seven and ten subject firms on these research topics. So where does, where does user experience live within their organization? How do they prioritize projects? How do they analyze and define metrics? Um, what's their accountability and how they push products into their development, projects into their development pipeline? And so far, we've already, um, I've already done the research with KQED and Cathay Pacific, and we have ESPN, Bank of America, and Belkin on, on board, and there's going to be some others. It's going to be published in February, and I think it's going to be a really interesting study. So I had to get that really shameless plug in there. But thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to getting your questions. And now we will have Klaus Kaskert from Yahoo. 
Thanks. Well, that was actually a pretty good overlap because I am going to be talking a lot about uh, changing customer behavior, changing user behaviors, and I'll argue that that is really what it's uh, all about when we're talking about ROI on the web, at least. Um, so, okay, see if I can get this going. I've got like uh, 22 slides, I believe, in 20 minutes, so <laughs> that's my fault. I'll be, I'll be moving uh, more than a little fast. Um, some of you probably recognize this. Um, you know, it's just a reality for the, for the, for the daily work that, that, that we do or the organizations that we move in. Um, I think that um, even though uh, we, we're sometimes kind of a, a bunch of whiners as a profession, I think uh, there's some truth to this, and we do acknowledge it ourselves. Um, this is from a, a KaiWeb discussion uh, last year uh, that I think is, is really uh, to the point. But this is, uh, this is very much how a lot of us view our daily lives. We work with some fuzzy goals. There's really no accountability. You mentioned that as well. That also means there's no sharing in the success. Um, there's decreasing visibility and influence. We're thought of as a pair of hands rather than heads. Um, and we don't really know a whole lot about specific uh, business objectives or principles of, of business management and strategy. Um, but um, that seems to be changing, not only in our community. I mean, we're talking more about ROI. We're, we're, we're wrapping our heads around it. Um, obviously, um, uh, with the... With the dot com implosion, um, there's a, a lot more focus on, on uh, ROI and data is taken more seriously, which should be a, a good thing for us, actually. So obviously, um, ROI has become this really hot potato. Um, and for those of you who, are, who were here, I think it was last month, where we discussed ROI as well, you also know that it's, it's, it's often misused, it's often misunderstood by us, and it's certainly used in unreliable ways. Scott has written that. I'm not going to mention any names, um, but um, <laughs> uh, Scott has written a great uh, paper on that on boxes and, ar and arrows. Um, still, even though we're having a hard time wrapping our heads around this uh, concept, it's so important for us to be able to articulate the value of research and design, and probably now more than ever. So we really need to become better at defining our value and pursuing it and articulating that value, whether or not it can be quantified. So what I'll talk about uh, tonight is really kind of uh, viewing the value that we bring on four different levels uh, relative to giving uh, specific feedback for design or research giving specific uh, feedback for design and relative to key business metrics and to informing strategic product decisions and relative to what I call organizational design. So let's take them one at a time. Um, they become increasingly ab abstract and increasingly hard for us to articulate. Um, so um, let, me get, let me try to give some examples um, so directional feedback for design, let me give an example from a Yahoo uh, a redesign a, a couple of months ago. We launched a new Yahoo shopping. And one of the things that's really a, a key feature in there is comparison shopping. And those of you who follow kind of the e-commerce e arena knows that that's a, a, a impor really important feature. In the old Yahoo shopping, user recognition of product comparison was really low. And, you know, you can do the, the kind of traditional usability studies and you show that... Um, you know, the, the, the checkboxes float here and they're not really uh, noticeable and people click this compare feature without uh, hitting the, clicking the boxes and they don't read the error message. A lot of problems. You, you redesign it and you uh, use some good design principles to make it more usable, improve visual associations between the call to action and, and the action areas. And uh, with some um, uh, skill and luck, you um, have your usage go up, and you might even be, you know, mentioned positive by industry commentators. And um, so that really, that, that's kind of the first very simple level of, of adding value. Um, and I think, you know, we, we're, we all know how to articulate that. But the next ones uh, we're not as good at, and I'm going to spend some time on this second one relative to uh, what I call key business metrics. So um, there, are, there are different types of met metrics. So this is just an example of, um, of some of the metrics that could be important. Um, and um, depending on what your, what your, your, your revenue model and your, your product strategy is. At, at uh, Yahoo, we, we do these uh, different types of, of benchmarking in order to measure whether uh, we've met a set uh, goal, whether it be a user experience objective or, or, or a business objective. So we do in-lab 
benchmarking, looking at stuff like time on task and error rates. Uh, we use uh, we work with Vividence a lot to do more quantitative um, user experience uh, research, and of course we have a lot of in-house metrics as all web companies do today, and and it's they're, they're all equally important to us. So um, what I really want to talk about um, for about four minutes now, um, when we talk about uh, the value that we bring relative to key business metrics, is uh, something that. Well, you mentioned persuasive design, you mentioned B.J. Fogg, which is a great book for us in, in this whole discussion. I want to go back a couple of years, actually, um, when I was working at Hotmail. And um, <clears throat> my manager, Rob Aseron, and I did a talk, um, a couple of talks, actually, in Europe, where we, um, we talked about how UI design is really not that interesting and how usability with a big U, you know, whether we're following in one guideline or not, is not really interesting. What is interesting is whether we're changing people's behaviors. And what we're really doing is that we as designers and researchers are designing behaviors. And the UIs are just our vehicle for doing that. And, um, and that was kind of one of the ways that we started thinking, we started articulating that very clearly as a way for us to kind of survive those, those hard times and, and really be able to, to uh, articulate our value. Um, and I think that um, what we're talking about when we're talking about persuasive design is really that um, it's about changing behaviors. Uh, you know, you can do marketing campaigns and you'll see, uh, you'll see uh, kind of peaks in, in, in people's behaviors, be it uh, sign up for this or use the address book and it's so easy, blah, blah, blah. And, and usage will go up for a couple of days and then go back to its normal, uh, normal numbers, so to speak. Um, and that's... that's that's just the way it is with marketing campaigns. Everybody knows that. But our job is really to change behavior over time. And there's a big difference. And so persuasive design is really about not looking at your page and say, how can I make this page usable? But looking at your objective. What's, what are the business objectives you're trying to accomplish? And then you work your way backwards. What do you want the user to do? And when you're looking at this page, what do you want the user to do next from this page? And that's really where you start. And then you have the necessary information, ideally, and you serve the right information at the right time in the right way. And that's what persuasive design is all about. And of course, so I just, I just pick one example from, 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 from Fogg's book where he goes through a, a, a number of principles of persuasive design. This is an obvious one uh, from Amazon. Give uh, 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 people the right information at the right time. It seems to work really well. Um, I want to give another example again. So this goes back to, to our talk for uh, a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> We changed uh, Hotmail's error handling, and obviously the, the, the uh, well, not obviously, but the business goals was to, uh, some of the, one of the business goals was to uh, decrease the, the number of customer support calls we got, but also use, change our way of thinking about error messages and, and use it as a way to upsell products in, in, at, at, at opportune moments, so to speak. So something like this would never, ever pass a, usability inspection, you know, using, using guidelines or using heuristics. Um, nonetheless, serving information like this at a relevant time where a user is trying to upload or trying to attach a document to send to someone, but because you have this free Hotmail account, you can only attach a, a megabyte. At that point of time, the user is really uh, ready to, to spend the 20 bucks a month to sign up for this. Um, so again, it never passed a usability inspection. It had a huge impact uh, uh, on, on signups. We, we got uh, quite a lot of signups through um, interventions just like this. Another example is Hotmail had a, 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 a big problem um, with people actually not using the address book. Why is that a problem for, for Hotmail? It's a problem to the user because it's, they're not using a feature that's actually really helpful. Instead, they're serving or they're, they're storing all their mail because that's how they go back and find their email addresses. Uh, it's, it's really ineffective for the user and it's darn expensive for Hotmail. So if you can change that behavior, you're saving Hotmail a lot of money via server uh, storage. And again, and Yahoo Mail uses the same principle here. Fairly straightforward. Uh, find the opportune moment to intervene. Understand that the task flows, understand the, the user behavior. Um, Users love this screen as kind of a, a way to say, it's sent. We've actually experimented, remember we experimented with taking this page away, 
and users were, were like, well, did it, did it actually go? Um, so they like this page. It's a good opportunity to um, make some media money. And then you can really use this as a, as an, as a vehicle to get people to, in an easy uh, way, um, populate their address book. And in the long run, you'll, you'll save money because people won't be storing messages just because they want to go back to their, um, to their uh, addresses or find addresses in their inbox. So um, those are examples of, of, of user experience uh, or, or our value relative to key business metrics. And I think that that's really an area where, if I look back over the last two or three years, where we've really improved as a community. I think a lot of us are really thinking about this in terms of persuasive design or in terms of designing uh, new behaviors. Um, it gets harder when we move down to, to these uh, values, so to speak. Uh, first of all, um, I mean, speaking of value relative to informing strategic product decision, it's, it's been, um, ever since I entered this profession, at least in the early 80s, um, we've been talking about, oh, we need to move, uh, you know, research and design uh, 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 further up, you know, in, in the process, uh, come in before, not just usability testing and all that. And I'm really not sure um, how much this has really changed. I know that we do, uh, you know, we, we, we do more field studies, um, um, but I still don't think that we really got a good handle on, on what, it, what it means for us to, um, to inform strategic product decisions. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I'm going to jump pretty much quickly uh, pass that and to this uh, next level because I think they're, they're really related. Uh, so the value that we can bring relative to organizational design and um, uh, my thinking on this the last uh, couple of months has been uh, influenced by my colleague John Sapolsky. Um, and, and it's really saying, well, look, we tend to focus a lot on what we design, on the artifacts and the deliverables, and not so much on how we design. And if you look at a, at a product lifetime um, or life cycle, um, the, the value of, of what we invest might actually um, be higher if we look at how we design, not necessarily if we're talking about a new product and innovation, um, but when products become a, more of a commodity, it, we might actually improve the return that we bring, the value that we bring, if we're better at really um, um, looking at how we design and how we can use design to change organizational processes and increase our social capital. So um, a couple of quotes from um, an article that I uh, personally like a lot from Peter Senge about building learning organizations because it really showed me uh, um, how some of these um, skills needed to, um, to, to um, manage modern organizations, learning organizations, are really skills that designers have or should have. So um, uh, the ability to build a shared vision, to bring to the surface and challenge prevailing mental models and to foster more systemic patterns of thinking are really skills that I think designers are, are really good at. So another example from this book, um, creative tension, it comes from seeing clearly where we want to be, that's our vision, and telling the truth about where we are, our current reality. Now that's, from, from, from those of you who remember the, the um, participatory design movement in, in Scandinavia in the 70s and 80s, uh, that's what design was really all about, and it was called the dilemma between tradition and transcendence. And design was really rooted in, in this, you, you, you gotta start at what people know about, you gotta root what you create, your innovations, in people's current understandings. And then you innovate from that, so you need both. So that's a dilemma that designers move in on a daily basis. Uh, surface prevailing mental models at several different levels. Uh, at the, 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 I've been at Yahoo about a, a year now, and I, I've noticed, I think, uh, uh, a lot of us have noticed that um, the successful products or the success, successful projects are really projects where um, the actors in these projects manage to build um, uh, uh, a shared vision and a, and a shared model of, of, of the of the business space. And um, to surface prevailing mental models is really something that I think um, uh, UED researchers and designers are good at as well. And again, you can do that at, at several levels. You can look at sort of just what's 
but what happened, like, uh, like most of um, what you see in the news and the television is just recording events. And you can start to look at patterns of, 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 of events or patterns of behavior. And you can abstract that up to some systemic structure and say, well, what really caused these patterns to emerge and these actions to emerge? Now, for, again, for designers and, and, and researchers, that's why I'm mentioning this. This is, a, this is what we're trained to do. I mean, um, for those of you who know about activity theory, this is activity theory. This is, um, you know, actions and, and can you remember behaviors, actions and activities, I think. Um, so, so I think we're trained in doing these types of analysis. Uh, we're just not trained to do them, to, 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 to do these types of analysis at a, uh, at a, at a more social level that transcends looking at, at UIs and interactions between humans and, and computers. So um, following that, this is um, um, just a model from uh, um, a paper that I just want to point you to by John and, and Jared Braderman. That's on boxes and arrows that I highly recommend. And as you can see, their um, uh, distinction between focusing on traditional UI design, the more uh, product-oriented or experience design, and then moving into the, to the organizational or social uh, sphere, is, uh, is something that's reflected in my distinction between these different levels of, of, the, of how we can look at the value we add. Um, so I just wanted to bring that in there because I think it's a great, great paper that I highly recommend. That's it. Thanks. I did it in 20. <laughs> And now we will hear from Jeff Herman from eBay. I just wanted to start by uh, thanking Rashmi for organizing this panel. I think that this topic overall in terms of um, designers being able to communicate their worth within the company is really critical to all of us. And uh, it's, it's really gratifying to see so many people that are here tonight that are interested in this topic. Um, I'll start by giving you a little bit of background about um, myself, also about the UI design group at eBay, and then some information about eBay overall. And then I'll go into the heart of the, the, uh, the t topic, which is really um, a process that we've um, put together over time that really enables us to um, propose projects within the company, get those projects approved using an ROI, and uh, ensuring that those projects are also successful. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm currently a design manager at, Yacht, at e eBay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> um, I've been there for a couple of years. Uh, previously, I was at Yahoo. Um, I was a designer at Apple for about five years. And um, I was also at the MIT Media Lab. Um, this talk is really about the, the UI design group and what we've been able to do. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about them as well. Um, we're at about 22 people. That includes uh, both UI designers and prototypers. Um, the group has doubled in size in the last year. And I think that's partly because of um, some of the su successful projects that I'll talk to you about. And we're also expecting uh, significant growth for uh, 2004. Uh, we design the user experience for all of eBay sites um, around the world. We collaborate with a number of groups within the company, including product management, uh, usability, visual design, um, the finance group, which I'll talk about as part of my talk, uh, and different business unit units, as well as the user community. We also um, initiate long-term strategies, and we put together projects that uh, really take us in that direction. So some, some information about eBay. Um, a few things about just the, the sheer scale of it. Um, currently, there's over 10 million items for sale on eBay. Um, eBay is currently in 27 different countries uh, where we have uh, sites in those countries. Um, so that gives you some sense of the, the scale of the site. It's also important to know that just the volume, the sheer volume of the site, in 2003, um, the value of all goods sold on eBay will be over $23 billion. And uh, the last point is that we currently have over 85 million registered users. And this issue about registered users is actually one that I'll use um, as a theme talking about this process that we went through. And I'll use this uh, project that we did to address this issue um, throughout the talk. So I want to take you back a couple of years to um, uh, about a year and a half ago, actually where at that time we had about 50 million registered users. And 
we started looking, um, the UI design group started looking around the site to see you know, what's a part of the site that we could really influence and really have an impact on. And we started focusing on the registration process. And as we talked to people within the company about that, some people had the reaction, which was, you know, if 50 million people have been able to finish this process, what's really the problem? Um, actually, if you look kind of behind the numbers a little bit, um, even though the, the numbers, the, the total numbers increasing over time, the rate of growth um, year over year was, is actually, at this point, actually decreasing. So literally since the company started, the rate of growth over time was, was decreasing in terms of um, people uh, registering for eBay. Um, so as we started talking about this within the company, there, there were definitely a lot of people within the company who were focused on getting people into the registration process, but no one was really looking at the efficiency of the process overall. And I think partly because um, this graph, which is so, um, so impressive was actually kind of hiding some of the some of the problems. So what we did was we we went we started to put together this process, and the first thing that we need to do was really understand at eBay how are projects approved. So, starting with some very basic um, questions like, who approves projects? What criteria do they use to approve these projects? Um, at eBay, we have the benefit that the process, the project appro approval process, is, is open in the sense that um, anyone who has a sponsor can propose a project. A sponsor is someone within the company who has money to fund projects. Um, typically, that's a, a VP within the company. And um, uh, we're fortunate within the user experience group that the, the, VP are, the VP of our group has money to fund those projects. Um, the next point is that. Um, the approval for projects come from, comes from the executive staff. Um, when you put together your plan, you basically uh, present to them, uh, describing what your project is, um, presenting your ROI, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the benefit of this is that their approval is comprehensive. You don't have to um, you know, worry that later on someone will try to cancel your project. Once it's been approved, it's basically good to go at that point. Um, and also that the criteria that they use for approving projects is standard and objective. It's really a combination of um, looking at what are the short-term goals for the company, looking at the long-term goals for the company, as well as um, looking at the ROI for your project. The second step that we do is really understanding the levers that drive um, the business. In eBay's case, that's things like uh, bids, uh, when, when a user bids for an item, uh, when a seller lists an item for sale, uh, registered users, as I mentioned before, but also controlling costs, um, things like customer service, um, engineering time, those are both costs that um, the user experience can influence. We also want to understand the value of those levers. So in our case, for registered users, the question was, what's the monetary value for, value for each registered user to the company? And as we started talking to people within the company, uh, we found out that actually the finance group has a standard value for each one of these levers. They can tell you for, um, they basically created these models that can tell you for each in, uh, incremental bid, what's the value of that to the company? And the same thing with registered users. We also looked at, um, you know, it's important to figure out how the user experience that you're creating as a designer can really affect those levers. In our case, um, our hypothesis, which is fairly straightforward, was that by, using the, by improving the registration user experience, um, we would be able to increase the percentage of users uh, who could complete that process. The third step that we do is really determining both current issues and future opportunities. Um, so in terms of the current issues, really proactively doing research, looking at user experience on the site today. Um, so one of the, the first things that we did with the registration process was to look, really look at the site stats. And that's when we saw, um, you know, even though the, there was a, a very large number of people who start the process, um, percentage-wise, actually a lot of people were dropping off during the process. Um, so the site stats helped us figure 